what we did in the last video is we looked over the mathematical process of doing the the RP1404 method you would call it and in this video I want to go over one of the key concepts and key findings of all that work so let me just start again by a quick reminder of what that modeling procedure was like so again we started with the assumption that we had monthly utility bills for at least a year so this building has been operating in a very similar manner for some time now and that we can get some weather dependent model across the entire range of temperatures where this is the average average temperature of the month and this would be the energy use per day for each month so let's say just for an example let's say this was July and they had 10 times 10 to the 6 kilowatt hours total in July well to get this data point we would go ahead and we would divide it by 31 days so that's what these points are and we have a model that fits this and this is using one of the ASHRAE change point models now we wanted to go to some time scale that was less than monthly so what we would do now is we would go in and for a short period of time we would do some measurements of energy use and let's say we do it per hour so the energy over an hour and we do it and at some point if I just plot it against the outside air temperature you might get something that looks like this so say we only we took it for two weeks and the temperature only ranged from 50 degrees F to 70 degrees F what the RP1404 method does is it allows you to take this information here combine it with the information of this and you can essentially fill out the model for all the timestamps at the hourly level so let me pull in some plots just to maybe make this more clear than my poor drawing ability say for instance here is the whole building electricity consumption versus outdoor dry bulb temperature and this is coming from a simulator this is a large office building so this is the amount of energy used in an hour so it's consumption every hour and if you took that data and you let me grab this and you aggregate it up you would get a monthly signature that looks like this so you get you would get a model that would go through points and go up like that now an important consideration then is at what time of the year should you take this data so for instance let's say we go for two weeks you could take that two weeks from January 1st through January 14th, January 2nd through January 15th, all the way etc. to December 15th through, I guess, December 29th, all the way to whatever this would be, December 17th through December 31st. You have all these different options. And if you step by a day, that would be 8,760 of them for the whole year. Now, we didn't just also limit it to just two weeks. We started and we did testing with the full year model, so 12 months, and we just started dropping down to 11 months, 10 months, nine months. Let me scroll down, all the way down to three weeks, and the lowest amount we tested was two weeks of data. So for every length of monitoring and start date, we would get a model. And so you really had 
the number of models we had for one building was 8,760 starting days times we had 12 down to one month plus three weeks and two weeks times 14 lengths. And if you do the math for that, my apologies, I actually made a mistake. There's 8,760 hours in a year. There's 365 days. So let me go fix my mistake. Don't want to make careless mistakes. 365 different starting days. And if you did this math, you ended up getting 5,110 models. And we did this we repeated this for different building types. So this is per building, per climate zone. We did five or so building types. And we did eight different climate zones to see how that affected it. So that's quite a bit. 25,000 times four, 200,000 plus ordinary least squares models. So that's quite a bit. So we did a lot of programming in order to do this. But now you have all of this information. How do you possibly go about analyzing it in some sort of fashion? Well, what that work did is we made something we called a color area plot. It's really a two-dimensional color plot of the results. So the things we were interested in for these models were the coefficient of variation, which is an indicator of the spread and the normalized mean bias error is an indicator of bias whether or not you over predicted or under predicted this is an indicator of how accurately you could predict an individual data point so what we did to analyze this is we said okay for one building let's say a large office building like I just showed you before. We can go ahead and we can make this plot. And this is what the axes are going to be. So on this top axis, we go and put the length of a monitoring period from two weeks all the way to the full year. And from here, this is the starting date of Jan 1st all the way down to December 31st. And so you get this grid. If you can imagine two weeks is a column, it's a grid. And we have 365 times 14 of these. So you have 5,110 squares. Imagine this in a spreadsheet. And what we did is we said, okay, if we took the two week model starting January 1st and we got a CV value. And we said we had a CV value that was relatively high, that's bad, we would mark this red. If we had a CV value that was good or low, we would mark that cell green. And we would look at the patterns. And we also, so we, this would be a plot for just one of the regression outputs. So we would do a plot for CV and we would do one for, for bias. So actually let me bring one of these plots over because I think that will be much more clear. So here we go. Oop. I actually need to zoom out a little bit. Oh, zoom out. Oh. Okay. Here we go. So notice this is for a large office building and it's for CVs. And here are the eight different climate zones. So each one of these strips has 5,110 different cells. Green is a good model, red is a bad model. And here's the starting date. And the left side of this plot will be two weeks and the right side is green because it's for the full year. So this makes sense in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So on the very far right side of each strip, you notice it's all green because that is using a full year of hourly data. So that's really the baseline 
for all of this. But what's interesting now is you notice that if you have two weeks, two weeks of hourly data, if you start in the cold weather, it's not good, it's not good. But as soon as you start getting to a swing season, spring, things get as good as if you had a full year. And then you go into the summertime, it's hot, and it's not as good, it's not as good. And then you get to the swing season in fall. And again, you're getting models that are just as good as the full year. And, and so on and so forth. And you see this pattern across all of them. The other pattern you see is that you get this, this arm here, this shape. And there's a good reason for, for why that is. What makes for a good model, what we found, is if the average temperature for the period you that we're looking at was close to the average for the whole year, and if the range in temperature for your period 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 was as large as possible. And so if I go back to that plot, if I bring this back in, if you have six months of data and you want the average to match the year, well, you have to start this process earlier. And so that's why this arm keeps going up. Try and, try and wrap your head around this, right? So if you can imagine, this is the shortest part. Actually, let me, let me draw this. Let me draw this on, on, on here. So what we were getting is something that looked like that. So at two weeks, the, the range of dates you had is much smaller. And if, say, this is the middle of the swing season, so April 1st, and that's, that's prime time. That's what you want to be essentially the center of your data range. Well, if we go here and we have, say, four months, right, to be centered on April 1st with four months, we need to start earlier. to get your, your best model. And, this, and the same logic keeps holding up until you're at a, 11 months where it's pretty much covering the whole period period anyways. So this is one of the key findings that we got out of this is that if you're going to do short-term monitoring and you want to do it and get as accurate results as if you did for the whole year, do it at a time when the average temperature of that period is near the yearly temperature and that range is as high as it goes and I'm already over my 12 minute mark and so I'll see you in the next video.